Welcome to Third Thursday. Hello, I'm Donna Owens, Program Director for the Ocali Family Center. Each month, the Ocali Family Center presents a live web stream broadcast on a topic of interest to parents of children and adults with developmental disabilities, including autism spectrum disorders. Each broadcast is recorded and archived on the Family Center webpage. We have covered topics from tools for transition, to puberty and sexuality, to a review of sensory issues for individuals with disabilities. So if you want to see our previous broadcast, a list of those previous broadcasts, go to the Ocali Family Center webpage and click on the third Thursday icon. You can see the list there. If you see a topic that would be of interest to another family that you know, please refer them to the Ocali Family Center webpage and our third Thursday broadcasts. Now, today's topic is how to prepare your child for a good school year. All of us, parents and teachers alike, want our children and our students, no matter what age they are or what challenges they may face, to get off to a good school year. As parents, what can we do to help make that happen? Today I'm going to be talking to Margaret Oliver. She's a parent of a young man on the autism spectrum, and she's also a teacher in the K-8 through program at Akron City Schools. She's written a book on ASD and kindergarten uh, also, and she's taught for over 10 years now. And one of the first ways I got to know Margaret was when we met at an OcaliCon conference, mm -hmm. and she said, I wasn't always a teacher. I had a son with a disability, and I found myself saying, teachers should do this, and teachers should do that. And then she said, I finally realized I should become a teacher. And, and so I did. <laughs> and so Margaret has been seen both sides of the divide between parents and teachers. She is particularly committed to effective parent-teacher communication. And so I want to thank you, Margaret. You're welcome. For coming to be here today and to share your thoughts with us on this really important topic. Yes. We do want all kids to get off to uh, a positive start to mm -hmm. every school year. And I know that you have a lot of ideas to help us help, uh, help us do that. And so um, I know one of the biggest transitions for kids, for all kids and for kids with disabilities, and I remember this transition for myself, and that was taking my own son to kindergarten. And the hardest thing I ever did was walking out of that classroom mm -hmm. to leave him with these adults that he didn't know and all these other kids. And so uh, it, it's a frightening ex experience. So let's start with that kindergarten transition. And I know that we have a handout on our webpage that Margaret has prepared that you see this as a process over a year Correct. In, in terms of preparing. Right. So talk to us about that important kindergarten transition. Okay, now kindergarten is, you know, it's a difficult year to start for any new child. It's exciting, you know, it's daring, it's new. But for the parents, of a child with special needs, it's a little more important, and um, it's a little, you're on unknown ground. You don't know what's coming ahead. Right. So, and two, what parents need to know, when they need to be an, a very effective advocate is when they have no experience on advocating. Mm -hmm. So the transition true. timeline is going to help with that. Um, research shows that the most important year to get right in the K through 12 education is the kindergarten year. If you get it right, that good success follows the student all the way up to the day he graduates. Mm -hmm. If it's not right, it's hard to admit to correct. And by the time the student is in third grade, sometimes there's no turning back. Mm -hmm. So research proves that it's a very, very important year to get the transition right. And you know, parents need to know too, it's not, it's not their kindergarten anymore. It's not the half day, take your nap, learn your crayon colors. Right. You know, it's, it's intense. It's uh, with the common core standards with education and academics, it is equivalent to what first grade used to be. Right. A full day program. And in addition, you could have, um, in Ohio, the requirement is you can have up to 25 kindergartners with one teacher. And that's for a full day program. So there's a lot happening in that kindergarten year. The parent really wants to get it right without the knowledge, you know, the knowledge base. So a little footwork done in advance would really help. Mm -hmm. On the transition timeline, yes. um, we've got, we're going a full year back before this 
the, a full year before the child starts kindergarten. You start thinking about this right. a whole year before. Right, right. And I know you read the books of those in New York City who uh, the day their child is born, they <laughs> right. sign them up for the... <laughs> right. <laughs> we yeah. don't have to go back that far, but in yeah. a typical scenario, a year before kindergarten starts, you want to look into where you think your child would best be educated. You've got options of homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, you could find one of the charter schools that might be very right. specific to your child's need. There could be a private school. You might want your child attending a private school that you went to. Mm -hmm. um, or there's the public school, your child's home school, where they have the right to, ha to be educated right. with everything they need. So you want to first decide where is the best place for your child. Mm -hmm. And you can find that out by talking to the preschool teachers that they're with now. If there are none, um, professionals in the community mm -hmm. can be helpful contacting the local school district just to even find out what your options are. But you want to start looking, seeing where, right. would, where would be the best and place. And know that you have those choices. You want to know that Correct. you have those choices so you can check those choices mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And then once you get a pretty good idea of where that's going to be, then we're coming into spring and the parent by then hopefully knows where the child would be attending school for kindergarten next year. In the springtime, um, the parent would want to, if the child is in preschool, there's a special IEP that happens in about May. It's called a transition IEP. Right. It's not, you know, even if the IEP was already created four months earlier, you want this transition IEP. It's an IEP that helps the child prepare for kindergarten and the placement they're going to be in. Mm -hmm. And all the team members have input into that to make sure that the supports are there. So you've got the transition IEP. Um, if your child does not have an IEP, but you suspect that they would do well with one, it would be good uh, as soon as you suspect that, not just the spring, but even earlier, right. to contact the home school mm -hmm. and they can begin the testing process. Right, and say, I suspect my child has a disability, mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Right. And it's the responsibility of the district then to... At no cost to the parents. Right, exactly. So you want to make sure that that's in place. Um, when you do have your final placement decided mm -hmm. in the spring before the school shuts down for the summer, right. before the janitors polish up the floor, you want to make sure that you know the calendar for the next year. Mm -hmm. So when is the first day of school? When is there an open house before school if that would occur? Um, when does the principal get back in the building? And what is the contact information for that? Who is the child's teacher, if it's already known? Mm -hmm. May I have contact information for that teacher over the mm -hmm. summer? So that's what you want to be pulling together in the spring. Right. Okay, then we got the summer before school begins. Yes. It's a really good time to take the big picture of kindergarten, the whole new place the child would be going, and start taking it apart piece by piece so that the child can start getting used to it. Mm -hmm. Like if it's in your neighborhood school, maybe some night after dinner and you have ice cream, go walk to the playground and just, when it's not crowded, get used to all the equipment. Mm -hmm. You know, and one little thing <laughs> all teachers want, make sure your child goes down the slide sitting. <laughs> sitting, <laughs> don't, not don't let them get the, Don't let them get the habit of going head first because yeah. we'll have to reverse that and it's oh, a hard okay. one. <laughs> so just one little thing. But um, in the summertime, you want to start getting them ready. Let them go shopping for you for the uniform, if it is a uniform, or for the school clothes, for the school supplies. Mm -hmm. um, um, once the school is open before the school year begins, a lot of times teachers will get in a week or two before school starts. Mm -hmm find out, contact the school, contact the teacher, can you bring the child in to see what the room is like? Mm -hmm. um, even if that's not possible, get them in the building just to see where is the cafeteria, where is the gym, where is the water fountain, where is the bathroom, right. familiar with everything. Yes, yes, they've got a chance to kind of walk through to see this is the building, this is the door, this is what the hallways look like, this is where the principal's office is, and so right. they have a sense of that. And that eases their anxiety. Right. They have a picture in their mind now what it's right. like. Plus, T talk about pictures, take pictures of the school true. and have them at home, make a little book. Um, Johnny's gonna start school, here's his classroom, right. here's his teacher. Mm -hmm. So just the more familiar you can make this right. unfamiliar setting, the less anxiety the child will have. Right. This also gives you an opportunity to talk about school with your child. Yes. And, and and to have conversations about, I don't know, what, what they might be worried about, what they're looking forward to, you know, what what, what, what did they think, you know, what, what have other kids told them about school? Right, and, right. And, and so, and a part of that, you can put a positive spin on 
as as uh, as just a part of the conversation. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's, and school becomes a part of the fabric of their lives. Mm -hmm. That expectation. Right. Very good. Very good. Any other right now? Well, well have, what now? What about kindergarten? Have we missed something? I'm I'm thinking about this big issue of transportation. Transportation. Okay. Now, if we can go beyond kindergarten here. Okay, we can. Because with transportation, um, again, it's a very important transition. It gets yes. them gets you out of the home into the school. Right. One of the many transitions per day. When a child has an IEP, there's one section on the IEP that specifically addresses transportation right. and asked is this ch child eligible for school provided transportation what that usually interprets if they are and usually autism is a diagnosis that allows that mm -hmm. if they are eligible the school could provide smaller more um, smaller yeah like mm -hmm. a van transportation so that the child doesn't have to get on the bus right and so they could be very they could be eligible for van transportation mm -hmm. that comes to your door takes the child to the school and a lot of times with van transportation there'll be an adult a, an aide or a teacher waiting for the child at mm -hmm. when the van arrives right so that is a, a good solution to tra uh, transportation mm -hmm. if a parent is going to be using that van transportation there's a lot of coordinating that goes on right before school begins they may be pushing two three days before school starts and they haven't heard anything mm -hmm. that's the time the parent needs to call the school and say can you please let me know who my van driver is right and it's a sm usually it's a van driver up to six students mm -hmm. all from the same neighborhood and then the van driver will take them all the same age range right. they're going to put high schoolers in with a kindergartner right right so yes. that would be one ideal way mm -hmm. close to ideal um, if you're in your home school, you may have the child walk to school. Mm -hmm. Now, a kindergartner, right. I'm sure you're going to walk, take sure. them with you. Right. Um, if a child is older and walks on their own to school, say mm -hmm. third grade and up, I think a parent would still want to make sure they're getting there safely, that, that they aren't running into bullies, right. that they aren't being bamboozled by somebody who knows that they're easy to talk their lunch money out of. Right. So we want to have something in place if walking is the ideal thing, mm -hmm. either the parents continue to walk with them or they know that there's a safe person they can walk with mm -hmm. or they have somebody shadowing. Right. Right. So that if they're walking, yeah. you would want those. Mm -hmm. That's where older brothers place. and sisters come in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. really yeah. handy, don't yes. they? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, that's a good one. Yes, but but we want to think about that transportation, whether it's in a van or whether it's walking, as mm -hmm. the child going to feel comfortable and safe. Right, that's one of the things we want. Right, to think and about. you know another option, a parent can drive the child to school. One request I do have: once the parent gets a child into the school right. and into the classroom. They can go, you know, it's where they're Even safe the with us. Even if the kid's crying? Mm -hmm. Even yeah. if they're crying? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I know, I understand because I've seen it from both ends. Yes. And I've had to, I've had to call like after I, an hour after I got my son to school, I'd have to call, can you tell me, is he doing okay? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, within five minutes. Yes. Right. So, and it's mm -hmm. all part of the transition. So it just kind of, it helps a child work toward independence. Mm -hmm. They're in a safe place. Right. So we can move them on. Um, a word about the school bus, the typical school bus that yes. gen ed kids take, if at all possible, I would avoid it. Mm -hmm. if, especially if there are sensory needs Issues. that the child has, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, because they're they are loud. There's not much supervision. Mm -hmm. You know, there are cameras on a lot of them, but by then something's right. already happened. If it is necessary, I would want an adult in there sitting with the child, mm -hmm. or if that's not possible, have the child sit right behind the bus driver. Right, right. So the point you're making here is that transportation is an important issue and one that's even IEP worthy. Yes. It's worthy yes. of discussion. We have. To, you, you, we need to give it that consideration. Correct. Yes. Correct. Okay. And tied on to transportation is one thing I wanted to say too, is the transition routines. Um, when a child is coming to school or going home, they are transitioning. So the parents can help out a lot by having a reliable transition a reliable schedule in the morning right and again in the evening mm -hmm. because if that van is coming and they're going to wait two minutes for you those two minutes are really going to be stressed if the child's shoes aren't on and hasn't finished his cereal right so if you could get a good routine in the morning and then when the child comes home another mm -hmm. nighttime routine that helps them you know gives them opportunity to relax right gives them right. opportunity to get their work done 
be part of the family, uh -huh. but just something that's reliable, something they can count right. on. So, and so you're saying even at the kindergarten age, start laying in a routine mm -hmm. that's going to get your child to the place that they're ready when the transportation gets there. And you know the good thing about that routine, we want our children to be uh, independent functioning right. adults. Yes. If they see that they have a routine in kindergarten that they've practiced for 13 mm -hmm. years, they're probably going to be able to get themselves ready for work with a routine. Right. right. So it's really practice for their adult life. It is. It is. I mean, most of what we learn in school. I mean, and that's the yeah. purpose of school yeah. is preparing you for your adult life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 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 setting those routines even at the kindergarten age is is important. Good That's place to saying. start. Yes. Right. Right. So now, so we're past. Say we're past the kindergarten um, uh, transition, and maybe your child's going to the uh, second, third, fourth grade, or or whatever. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't even, you don't have to worry about the transition once you've gone through this kindergarten transition. You still want to be. Uh, thoughtful and right, right. observant. Yeah, the, the thing that the child has on their side is that the, the building is the same. Right, right. But you have to remember, you know, in working with young children with autism, mm -hmm. I, for example, would teach a child hands to self. Mm -hmm. And that child would get that in the classroom, be perfect at it. But when I move them to the cafeteria, it's a whole new setting and hands to self needs to be taught again. Mm -hmm. The same thing kind of happens when a child is going from like second grade to third grade. Right. Suddenly it's not the same classroom. Mm -hmm. And they may have lunch, um, the second lunch instead of the first. Right. The teacher's going to be different. Their best friend might not be there with them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that suddenly is, you know, we see it as it's pretty nothing. similar. Yes. Yeah, it's a similar situation, you know, easy peasy. Right. The kid sees it as a whole new situation. Mm -hmm. So again, um, helping the child over the summer prepare for those changes. Right. Like even one example, if they're going to have the second lunch, if at home they're used to having lunch at 11.30, right. maybe sometimes say, let's practice at 12 today just so we can practice a later mm -hmm. lunch. You know, and just kind of get the child, again, understanding what to right. be, what's going to be expected mm -hmm. to bring that anxiety down. Right. So you're anticipating the changes they're going to face so you right. can help right. uh, acclimate them Correct. to what those changes are. Right, right. Um, now, now we all know that elementary school is very different. Kids get into middle school, and, and it started uh, now already, and, and they may have a number of different teachers, and certainly when they get to high school, they're going to have lots of different teachers, and uh, that's, that's going to be a change both for the children, the students, and for the parents. Yes. And so how do you prepare students for that kind of... Um, Th that kind of change. You start with the parents. Uh -huh. And parents, this is not going to be fun. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> that transition into middle school, because elementary school allows the parent a lot more participation. Like you bring in the cupcakes, you be a classroom right. helper, you come to all the activities, there's a PTA meeting. So participation is a very natural thing in elementary school. Mm -hmm. Then the child moves up to middle school, and there's not the participation from parents that they usually have. Um, the student now has more teachers, more transitions per the day, right. more homework, and more homework with more deadlines. So you have a project that isn't due just tomorrow, it's due a month from now with five steps getting there. Right. So all of this is happening at the time when your child and every other kid coming into middle school doesn't really have a real good sense of organization, planning, mm -hmm. initiative, all those executive functions. Right. And children with special needs are going to have further challenges that way. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe by by December, most of the kids now can go to the classroom with everything that they need mm -hmm. and turn their assignments in almost on time. Right. But it might take two, three years or never for some children to be able to, on their own, be able to, to do coordinate that. They may that. need some support in doing right, that. Right, right. So while all that is happening, here's where it gets hard for the parents. How do you contact the school to find out? Right. Who is this, you know, you asked your student, who do you have for math? Some guy. Mm -hmm. and oh, it's it, Mr. Nichols. Oh, yeah, okay. maybe. Well, yeah. Or was that my social study? Yeah, I don't right. remember. So you have a lot more people playing in the game mm -hmm. and you don't know how to contact them. Right. 
what the parent needs to do when the school year begins mm -hmm. is find out who the case manager is for your child. And the case manager is a teacher, is an intervention specialist who works with children with special needs in the middle school, mm -hmm. may or may not work directly with your child, but this case manager is responsible that for your child's implementation of the IEP and to to keep it current right so that's your that's your point that's, that's your, your point of contact mm -hmm. that's your point of communication for right. what's happening to your child throughout their school day is that right. case manager and you may have to the, the parent might have to call the school several times show up in person mm -hmm. to find out who the case manager is it may not even be known for the first week or so of school right the sooner you find out the better mm -hmm. and so when you find out who that is and then you understand who your child is another form that we have by the way is mm -hmm. um, the profile questionnaire? Yes, this works well for elementary students, mm -hmm. and it can help. It, it can help with the um, upper grades too. Now, when you look at it, the profile questionnaire part one, it has um, just it's skills for kindergarten. Uh -huh. This pretty much for a student with special needs could cover all the elementary grades. Okay, it may not be as applicable uh -huh. to a middle school. Um, but there are going to be parts on it that are. So we're looking at self-care, communication, socialization, behaviors, and academics, and anywhere from three to five categories under each. Right. You simply write down what support level your student needs. You just check off. You don't mm -hmm. even need to write anything. You right. check off. Um, and independent, eats independently, no support. Okay, um, okay. So you can look at those. So it's a profile that you can share with your child's teacher when your right. child's in, from kindergarten, say, through the elementary grades, but is what you're thinking. But part two is, I think anybody could use uh -huh. this. It's the, um, it says kindergarten, but it's where you fill in the blanks. What are the child's strengths? Okay. Interest, successful strategies that you would um, have used in the past. What else would you want the educator to know? Uh -huh. So when the child goes into middle school, you probably aren't going to meet the teachers until open house, right. mm -hmm. but you want them to know who your child is. It's overwhelming the first week of school, mm -hmm. especially you consider middle school. They'll have you know, up to 90 students. Right, And sure. to know who yours is in a mm -hmm. week's time might not be, happen quickly. Yeah. So if you could especially do part two of the profile and just make copies of that, give it to the case manager. If you don't know who that is, give it to the school secretary and say, please make sure that every student who were, every teacher She's or a, adult who works mm -hmm. with my child sees right. this. It's, yeah, it's a way for you to say this in a brief way, a mm -hmm. really brief way, this is who my child is. And this, right. these are important things for you to know about my child. And that speeds up the services for your child because yes. it shortens the length of time that the adults need to get to know who your child is, right. what his strengths are. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful very helpful. Right, and it would be helpful for a kindergarten teacher that wouldn't know your child particularly right. that's coming in to say he's uh, he or she's independent at, the, at this level or or may need some support in this area. Right, uh -huh. right. So it's a quick kind of concise way of here's what you need to know to 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 be best at supporting my child. Right, and then the teacher or the service provider, the uh -huh. speech therapist, occupational therapist, we kind of have a way of categorizing all the time. If right. I see a checklist like that, I'm thinking, okay, 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 I'm ready to run. Yes, right. So it really uh -huh. is helpful. Okay, okay. Now, I know that uh, one of the things that you are very committed to, and I mentioned at the beginning, is this issue of communication. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about supporting kids to get off to a good school year, and a part of that is supporting them throughout the school year, mm -hmm. at the beginning what we want to do is to set up some communication system with the educators that are responsible for our right, children. Right, right, right. And, you know, when I was a parent, I started out first as a parent of a child with special needs, and I was... Um, took a lot of initiative to find out where my son was going to be, who his teacher was, mm -hmm. how things were going. Sometimes it worked beautifully, sometimes I was frustrated. And then when I took the other side of the coin as a teacher, uh -huh. I would contact parents and sometimes have a difficult time or I would have a parent who was very abundant at sharing on the phone and then I would get an email this big mm -hmm. and it you know then it was then I found oh, it was kind of hard to pull out what I need yeah so over the years um, what helped best was just to have instead of hoping you know we always hope right but instead of just hoping that it would work out well 
and leaving it up to fate, mm -hmm. um, I found out the best plan is to have a plan. Right. So we made right. a communication uh, plan. That's right. And and the forms that you're going to be talking about, you have a communication planning form, a fact finding form, mm -hmm. and then kind of a communication contract. Right. 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 And you're going to explain both. Right. Correct. Correct. Because um, well, first of all, it's a form that can be done. I say I think recommend that you get this communication agreement between the parent and the teacher or teachers or case manager, or case manager mm -hmm. as soon as you can before this first day right. of school if possible. Now in elementary that's a little more possible because you've got open houses, teachers in right. there preparing. Uh, middle school, high school, you're just going to have to fly in and just do mm -hmm. your best. You know, the, the a parent is going to be the harder worker at the start. Yes, right. But you want to grab the teacher for five minutes should do the trick. Mm -hmm. And the first form, very simple, parent-teacher communication checklist. The parent's name, the teacher's name, and then three categories. What method or style of communication the frequency of the communication and your availability times. Okay. So the parent and teacher just has to go through this checklist and check off what works for uh -huh. them. So for um, the method or style, you check all that you can do. Like, um, would the teacher give out the cell phone number? Would they mm -hmm. like phone calls? Would they like to use email? Would they like texting? Would they like the communication notebook that goes back and forth? Or do they just does the parent just want a right. note from the teacher each day? Mm -hmm. So parent and so teacher. So what's our method of communication? Mm -hmm. What's our ideal method of correct then we want to see how frequently we want to communicate right. if it's uh, especially kindergarten you don't know how your little one's doing right you probably want something daily mm -hmm. by the time you're in middle school and you think you've got a good routine going maybe a weekly check on Friday right. that includes um, where the assignments are yes then, or some people, when the child is really independent, maybe every reporting period, every four and a half weeks, every nine weeks, whatever the school does. And then you agree on availability. So if there are phone calls, um, the parent is available from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Mm -hmm. The teacher is available 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Right. Each person sets their own availability. Right. They, you know, they have so the both the parent and the communication partner. Um, set out what their preferences are. So you can Correct. look at them and say, oh, okay, well, you know, here's the times that you're available. Right. This is the method that's best for you and this fits with me. Right. And how long it's going to take you to answer an email. Yeah. Right. So one form, you just need to look at each one as long as it takes to read a line and put a check mark. Uh -huh. So that is your working document to be able to come up with a communication plan that works throughout the full year. Right. And, and it works for both of you. Right. And I called it because it is individualized. Yes. Just like the IEP. Yes. The Individualized Communication Plan. It's mm -hmm. a mouthful, but it works. Right. I right. couldn't come up with anything shorter. Uh -huh. So you put the student's name at the top and the date. And in a box, you fill in what method or style you both agreed on. Mm -hmm. You know, one might want to text, but the other might not want to. So right. texting is out. So you put down what you both agree on. Uh -huh. Then you fill in your contact information. So it's a lot easier for both parties at a moment's notice right. to know where can I. And, you know, when, I'm, when I have these, I have a file on top of my desk. I keep all my copies. That fast, I've got the number. Very good. Okay, then once you complete the chart that where you both decide what's, what would work for you, you um, bring it down to what's agreeable and you fill out the individualized communication plan. Student's name, the date, you put down the method that works for both of mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. You put down your contact information so right. that you know quickly how to get hold of somebody. You put down your availability. Um, even though the parent might say, I'm available till 10 at night, the teacher might want to cut her work day off at 4 p.m. Right. So mm -hmm. you agree on that. And then the most important part at the bottom takes just a minute. The parent signs it, the teacher signs mm -hmm. it. And once you have that agreement, I would recommend for the um, parents, make several copies, keep one in the car, keep one at work, keep one um, mm -hmm. in the kitchen, one in your bedroom. Just all over right, the place. Because when the issue comes up, you want to be able to say, okay, now how am I going to get in touch with right. so and so? And the beauty of this is if there's good, consistent parent teacher mm -hmm. communication throughout right. the year, yeah. the child's going to benefit. It's mm -hmm. all for the benefit of the child moving as far as he can, as quickly as he can. Right. A lot right. of times, um, a parent or a teacher might be surprised that something wasn't going right. 
but they didn't know it right away. Like, mm -hmm. it's really important for parents when, say, there's a family tragedy, the, the dog died. Right. It's important mm -hmm. that the teacher know that. Right. To, un so the yes. teacher can understand, I know he's acting different today, but I don't know why. Mm -hmm. So keeping that communication open um, stops a lot of problems before they occur. Yes. And right. it really moves the child forward. Plus, you don't have to just depend on, do I get along with this teacher or not? Or does the teacher think that the parent is interested? Right. It's, it's right there. Right. You're both part of the team. And as time goes on, right. there is there, the cohesiveness does occur. Right. And it is intentional. It's Correct. not just luck. It's intentional. Right. It's important we have this shared, uh, uh, this shared topic, and we are going to communicate mm -hmm. about it. So the best plan is to have a plan. Yes, yes, the best plan is to have a plan. This can be particularly important in those cases, and I, we, and we had talked some about shifting into middle school when the academic expectations yes. are raised, and and these middle school students may not be mature uh, at that level mm -hmm. for some of those executive functioning kind of um, initiation, task initiation, right. following things over time. And that kind of communication can be really important. And that communication is going to show you that if each week, say you talk once a week to the case manager yes. or you get a report once a week, right. if the same problem shows up three weeks in a row and it's not resolved, uh -huh. then you know, go straight to the IEP, right. put in some more supports and get mm -hmm. it fixed. Uh, instead of going until spring right. and thinking, yes. oh my goodness, he's failing. Mm -hmm. And another thing important in middle school, and it's it happens, we don't want it to, but the, the children are still maturing. Right. There might be some bullying going on, mm -hmm. intentional or not, it might be going on. For example, I had one student who was aversive to the word Cheerios. He was. And <laughs> I, I had, we, we did social stories to, you know, how do you get acclimated to when you hear that? What is the best response? It's, you know, it's better to express it to an adult than it is to kick a kid beside you. Yeah. What would happen though is we have a middle school and they're sixth graders and you know they know that this kid reacts. And they so saw going. somebody else on the uh, upstairs in yeah. a crowd of kids yell out Cheerios. So, you know, if there's not communication going back and forth, the parent might not know that and the child might either be too embarrassed to bring mm -hmm. it up to the parent or not right. know how to express it right. or keep it in and bottle it. So that's another thing just how is the child moving through the daily life, the right. social life yes. of middle school? It's yeah. more challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the point that you're making here is that school is not just about academics. Correct. And the IEP is not just about academics. That school is actually about the whole child and Correct. that child's whole experience throughout their school day. And it's valid to ha both to have those concerns and to articulate those concerns. And to have them addressed yes, in the IEP if need be. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, I th and I think it's good for parents to know that, that, mm -hmm. that we're, when we're talking about getting a, a, a start, preparing for a good school year, but we're supporting that good school year as yes. it goes on. Yes. Right. And it all starts with good parent-teacher communication. Yes. And it's, it might be hard to start, it might be hard for the parent to get established to begin with. Right. And sometimes it's even kind of difficult to keep it going right. Uh -huh. But once you have this in writing, you've got more power. Yeah, you to do. make sure that it works yes, right. Right, right. And and as you said, you set a plan or a road that you've both agreed mm -hmm. to uh, to follow. And and I think in communication about changes because changes can occur mid year. Yes. In in terms of of what students' needs are and what your concerns are. Right. And uh, that IP is a fluid document, and its purpose is to support this student. Yes. Throughout yes. the school year, and so you you can bring up those changes. Uh, and they can be addressed within the IEP. It's not yes. just this annual. Right, right. It's uh -huh. there for when the child needs it. Right. And it's there for, for uh, the, its purpose is to support the child right. in his development. So yes, mm -hmm. we do it when we need it. Yeah, right. And, and um, the point I want to make also about that fluid IEP is that that a student's IEP is tied to their evaluation team report. Correct. When, when their assessment, when their MFE was. And so you may not have, we may not have IEP seasons when all the IEPs for next year are right. done between March and May. 
So the IEP for this year, because the student's placement is not going to change, it may have been done in December, but if you have specific transition issues about this next school year, you can call an IEP meeting to address just those issues. And you just need one team member to get an IEP right. meeting. We're and not that saying team is the, uh, the parent is a very important team member. Yes, so yes, yes, that's true. But we're not saying we have to bring the entire school staff around. Right. But possibly the case manager if we're talking about a middle high school student right. or uh, the uh, or the teacher the you know the main teacher if you're talking about an elementary school right. but it's okay it's valid to bring up those transition concerns yes, that you might yes. have cuz you know you could be surprised like we were talking about the child who's second grade going into third uh -huh. we may not think there's any big issue there but the child you know something could be going on with the child that right. makes it harder like you know the academics that are required in third grade to be able to um, find a big picture and to take the details that might be difficult right might need different supports um, on the plus side a child may have really increased their communication and so mm -hmm. doesn't need as much support so we and we can take that out add something right. in right and talking about IEPs um, when a student this is one point I, that's really really important for preschoolers, mm -hmm. if they have an IEP in preschool and they're moving up to kindergarten, it happened with my son. I've seen it happen with other students. Wow. My son was a rock star in his last year at preschool. Mm -hmm. Everything was blossoming. He was strong. He was doing well. And so with a new teacher and me as a new parent, we were saying, you know, we can drop, we can drop this down to a 504. He may not even need it, but let's just do a 504. And, you know, I went home that night and saw rainbows and unicorns. Yes. It was a wonderful night. Kindergarten started. It didn't go well. And it fell apart within uh, the first week or two. Uh -huh. And the reason for that is pre kindergarten is not a continuation of preschool. Right. Much more challenging. Right. Yes. So yes. you want to keep in the strongest supports after, like, if you find out that your child really doesn't need it, it's just as easy two months into the school year to make a change. Right. But it, it's it's a lot harder to pull those services back. Back, back once, together. Yeah. Yeah, and your point is before a major change, it might not be, it's not a good idea to, to withdraw the supports that have Correct. been successful. And, and they've been so successful, but let's make this change with this level of support and see if this if this change continues and we can drop it is yes. what you're saying yes but before a major transition is not the time to withdraw supports no. that have no. made this child <laughs> successful yeah right this is what your point is um, I uh, uh, I also know that when we talk about good communication in a good school year that you are a strong advocate for the power of the IEP, yes. the importance and the power yes. of the IEP, even to the point that you've got, you've given some forms here, given us some forms that we've shared as as a handout here on creating a good IEP and uh, implementing a good mm -hmm. IEP and how you know about that. And there are three parts of this whole IEP process that right. you wanted to talk about. So that used to seem so mysterious to me, especially when you know my son is three years old and all of a sudden I've got a 40-page document yes. of an IEP and it's it's overwhelming. And you know, as time went on, I kind of got used to what to expect out of the IEP meeting, but I never knew what floated to the top. I never knew what was most important. Uh -huh. And then it was time for me to go back to school, get licensure to be a special education teacher, two semesters of learning how to write IEPs, mm -hmm. learning about the power of them, you know, that's given to them right. as a legal document. And there's, it's again, it was almost overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I put it into practice. I gave each one the best I could. About five, six years into the process, I thought, I know what this boils down to. Yes. And what it boils down to, and you know, this isn't everything, but there's IEP links. So it mm -hmm. takes the child and it takes that child's needs and it links them to the services. Right. So now we know what the child needs, what what's most important what they need, we link it to a service. We take those services and we link them to the provider whether it be the gen ed teacher, the special ed teacher, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, mm -hmm. we link those services to a provider. And then the final link of this three-part chain is that the provider is then um, held accountable to provide those services to the student. Right. So really, it's um, once you know who the child is, mm -hmm. it's a simple three-step process. What does the child need? Who's going to give it to them? Let's make sure they give it to them. Right. 
Right, yes. And so, I mean, and there is, there, there's been a lot of thought given to the entire IEP process and how, it de and, and how it develops. But, but looking at it, when, you, when you, you're, you're first faced with it, I think, as a parent, it would just seem like, I, I don't know, some kind of college course almost. Right, right. And you almost wonder, what is all this stuff doing here? But the more I created IEPs with the team, right. implemented them with the student, mm -hmm. changed them as we needed them, the more I realized the beauty right. of the document, how well thought out it was, how uh -huh. well created it was, I wouldn't change a single thing uh -huh. on it. Right, It right. really has thought about uh, yes. how to service the student, how the student can have access to the to educational services mm -hmm. instead of how do you separate the child right. yeah. as a days of old. Yes, right. And, and, and I like your analogy of the links. The child's needs are linked to services, mm -hmm. which are then linked to service providers, and those providers are held accountable by providing progress reports. And that's the IEP. And, that, and that's... Yeah, right, and that's the IEP. So there are three elements in the IEP that you, you talk about very specifically that you think are just, that, that, that are central to our understanding of this student. And can you uh, describe those? Yeah, you know, when I first saw an IEP, I couldn't tell you if it was good, bad, or in between. Uh -huh. it was, I could tell you it was big. Right. That was the only adjective I had for it. <laughs> and it was necessary, I suppose. But, um, a parent, especially one whose child is new to the special education mm -hmm. services, who doesn't understand the process, they aren't going to know how to determine if this is effective or not. Right. I wouldn't call it. I wouldn't say it's a great one or a bad one. Right. You just want them to be effective. You want to be functional. Yes. Right. And so I look at two parts of the IEP to determine is okay. this effective. The first thing I look for is the profile. Page one of the IEP is just going to be general information, addresses, data. Page two is going to have the child's will have the child's profile, and this profile is completely a blank slate for the team to fill in. It doesn't really have to follow any one format, but what we do want of the profile is it it needs to describe the whole child, not just um, what the weaknesses are. Right. It needs to describe the whole child what the child likes, what the child can do, how the child could be moved forward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in every area. So the profile, anything in this profile should be addressed again in the IEP. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a good profile, um, there's one I had seen of a fifth grade student. Uh, Sarah is a fifth grade student at ABC school. Okay. How many other fifth graders <laughs> are there at ABC school? Yeah, yeah. Right. So that really didn't tell you much about Sarah that doesn't distinguish her no. from others. Yeah. Um, How should a student profile read? Can you I give think us any sure, kind of... Sure, sure, sure. Um, for example, a kindergarten profile. Okay. Um, Johnny is a five-year-old boy, enthusiastic, really loves the water. Um, he expresses that through swimming and playing in the sink. He um, especially likes playing with Legos. It's, he has good spatial awareness as he can be creative at making things. He tends to like to play alone, but at times will share his Legos with other students. So that's telling you, mm -hmm. you know, what just what Johnny's right, like. Kind He's of enthusiastic. Kid, yes. You can get you can get a picture of who this child right. is, uh -huh. and that this picture of this child is going to be different than someone else. Right. Um, from Johnny's ETR, the the evaluation team report from you know with a psychologist right. from Johnny's ETR, um, we see that he has some letter and word recognition, um, at a preschool level of whatever. Mm -hmm. In classroom assessments, Johnny has been able to identify 20 out of 26 letters of the alphabet and can identify the sounds that half of those make. Mm -hmm. uh, um, right, gives you a good, right. yeah, a good picture yeah. of academically kind of where he is in terms of language yeah. development or uh, letter recognition and word recognition. Oh, and another thing I'd put in that profile, he <laughs> loves the alphabet and he loves anything to do with the alphabet or counting. Uh -huh. Then and down below, you know, when we're talking about academics, he can count from one to a hundred. We've even heard him count higher. However, um, he he does not yet have one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay. And so you, when you know those things, then you know the teacher knows where we need to go academically yes. to take him further. So mm -hmm. we're putting things like that in. I also put down in my IEPs, I mentioned their social, how they mm -hmm. are socially, yes. and how they are behaviorally. 
Mm -hmm. And behaviorally, I don't mean good or bad. I just mean simply behaviorally. Like I had one student who was a little angel. Well, this little angel, we had his visual schedule and he would walk up to it. His arms would drop, his head would drop. He'd look at it. We would say, check your schedule. He couldn't, he didn't have the initiative to pull off the next piece and put it somewhere. <sighs> so, you know, he's not making trouble. He's not beating anybody up. Right. He didn't bite me. <laughs> but he, you know, he needs initiative in his life. So behaviorally, right. I, would, I would put down in classroom observations, he was able to initiate checking his schedule uh, three times out of ten, each time with adult prompting mm -hmm. up to three prompts. So just give some data, right. uh, just prove what I'm saying, mm -hmm. not just make things up, and put the whole picture there. So when we have this, and the speech therapist, you mm -hmm. know, if they did part of the evaluation, they and the occupational therapist need a part in the profile. Sure. The parents should add what they would like in the profile. Okay. You know, they, they have input of who. So it, it, it's kind of an overview with input from all the IEP team members. Right. That, that and when you read that, you can tell if it's effective as, all you have to say is, does this sound like my child? Mm -hmm. Or does it, does it sound like just any kid? Right. If it really sounds like your child, you're mm -hmm. ready to go. Right. right. So that's the first thing. And if it doesn't, say, can we go back and work on the profile? Mm -hmm. I would like to add this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, when you look at the IEP, go first to the profile. The mm -hmm. profile drives the whole IEP because the information we talked about then, we'll move on to the goals. So I would put a goal in for, you know, my little Christopher who couldn't check his schedule unless we helped him. Mm -hmm. I would put a goal in, I'd put some background information, you know, and then I would put the goal of um, when it's time to check his schedule, Christopher will do so independently or with one or few, with one prompt for 80% of mm -hmm. opportunities. Right. And so we have a goal that we know where we're going and why. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're teaching him initiative so when he's an adult, he can be more independent. Right. You know, that's my right. long-term goal. Yes. So when you look at a goal, and you know, say in math, say for Christopher, we had a, a goal for him in math, and his goal was he will add and subtract up to, up to 10. Well, why? So we better go back to the profile and say, wait a minute, we said he could count to 100, but he doesn't know one-to-one -one correspondence yet. Why are we working on addition and subtraction? Right. You know, he, uh, the, the profile said he needs this help. Right. So we want to make sure that what's in the profile gets addressed in the goals. Mm -hmm. If something is in the goal and it seems like it's out of left field, then it either needs to be added into the profile or it's deleted and something else. So, yeah. And in the IEP, if you have 15 or more goals, I would really wonder if that's an effective IEP mm -hmm. because we're not curing everything. We're not making everything right at once. Although as a teacher, I can promise we're always using every opportunity to work on a, a right. lot of areas. But what we're really trying to do is saying, what specifically does this child need to be more successful to take the next step to move up in math, mm -hmm. in reading, in socializing, in behavior, in speech? Right. So we want to really put our thoughts into what does he need Mm -hmm. to move on next. And so, you know, just because an IEP has 20 <coughs> goals doesn't mean it's going to work. Right. I can promise you the more goals you put in, the harder it is going to it's going to be to implement the IEP. Yeah. And to track mm -hmm. and, and and to keep it meaningful. Right. I think. Right. Um so because the purpose of the IEP is is, is to identify goals that are going to support that child's access and benefit from their their exactly. participation in a general education curriculum yes that's what you know that's what needs to be there mm -hmm. i know you're also the the third part of the ip of that process that you're very adamant oh, about yeah. is that progress reporting so yes. talk to me about yes. progress reports progress reports first of all the parent especially the new parent needs to understand that progress reports are not a report card you can hear a lot of terminology once you step into right. education but just remember that progress reports are tied to the IEP. Uh -huh. Report cards are just what everybody gets. Right. So if a child is going to school, he's going to get a report card. If he's going to school and has an IEP, he's going to get a report card and he's going to get progress reports. Right. The progress report looks at every goal and tells the parent in this time frame, you know, either the nine week reporting period or if it's interims, the four and a half week period, in this time frame, here's how your child did with his goal. Mm -hmm. He regressed, he stayed the same, he got better. Some percentages would help. Yes. 
and that's all it needs to say. You know, sometimes I get flowery and say, yeah. this has been wonderful, and you know, just makes parents happy, makes me happy. Yes, right. But that's, that's not the necessary part. You no. just want to know, are they regressing the same or moving right. forward and to what percentage. Mm -hmm. So on every single goal you have that mm -hmm. and it's due when if you have a report card in your hand you need progress reports. Uh -huh. The moment the parent doesn't have a progress report they need to contact the school mm -hmm. and request them. Right. It might not seem that important but over time I've noticed that the progress reports when they're done timely and given yes. out at each reporting period right is the parents proof that the IEP is being implemented, it's being followed, right. and it's probably going well. Mm -hmm. And if it's not coming out, somebody somewhere is either overwhelmed or is dropping the ball. Mm -hmm. And whatever it is, you wanna make sure that's remedied sooner instead right. of later. Yeah. And when I've seen parents who have needed to um, get advocates, um, maybe talk about a lawsuit, mm -hmm. or talk about right. just pulling the kid out of the school, the one thing it always has in common is they didn't get the progress reports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's that is our the parents guarantee that the IEP is being followed. Right. That is the teachers, the professionals um, duty by law to prove that it's been followed. Right. Well, and it it makes the the entire process without progress reports, the the IEP process is not given the um, the importance that right. it has. Right. If if the goal is important enough yes. to be included in this IEP, it it was critical to this child's development and we need to know how they're progressing. And and to lose that that connection with what that IEP goal is, is actually to lose that IEP goal. Yes, yes. Uh, it's what it is. So you're saying a strong IEP is one that the student's profile, you recognize your student, your right. child in that profile. And it's positive. <clears throat> and, it, and yes, and it's positive. Uh, and then there's the goals, that the goals are, articu are articulated there yes. and, and they address um, challenges that have been alluded to or a name in that student profile. Right. And then third is that the progress reports are given to parents when there's, if there's midterm reports that come out for all students in, in that grade level, there's also a, a progress report Correct. for that student. Yes. And certainly at, at grade levels. And those are the links all working together. Right, right, for that IEP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And did we review the, uh, you're creating the IEP, creating a good IEP, and then the implementing the good okay, IEP. Okay, here it is. And this would work not just for uh, kindergarten, this is for any IEP all the right. way up to the moment the child graduates. Yes. Very simple form. It's a checklist. So on creating the IEP, you know, you get the call that mm -hmm. the year is up or the parent said, I think we need to change here or the yeah. team decided. You, um, there's three things you need to check beforehand as the parent. You know, pre-meeting, make sure you have the invitation, right. make sure you have your ducks in a row, sure. everything you need. Then at the meeting, there's several uh, sections you want, and of course, I highlighted the profile and gave some, you mm -hmm. know, are the child's strengths there? Is it supported by data? Is the need for special education explained? Uh, the goals, are they precise? The parent's input, is the parent's input mm -hmm. included in here? So several things, and while the parent is at the meeting, it's no problem for the whole team to see that they have the checklist. Right. Keep it out in front of you. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the end, and if everyone agrees and we're all ready to sign off, mm -hmm. it would be fine for the parent to say, well, just let me check here, and then they can go through. And you know, just gives you that moment of thought because anytime you sign, it's like oh, for a yeah. car, for anything, it's right. like take a breath and do it. Yes. So this would give you a little more confidence yes. that, and you might yes, a little we've covered glitch. what we need to. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. that's for um, creating create, creating it. Now you've got it in hand. It's signed. It's your living document. Mm -hmm. So um, when you implement the IEP, keep this checklist at home and just uh, make sure like it shows what the task is, what the action is. Mm -hmm. So is the IEP older than a year? Like the, the parent might be moving to a new district. They pull right. out their IEP and it's a year and a half old. Uh-oh, it's out of compliance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is, is the IEP current and what you need to do? Um, are you receiving progress reports? Right. If so, good. If not, what to do? Has your child met a goal before the year is over? Mm -hmm. What do you do? 
you put a new one in. That's right. Sure. It's a great time. Mm -hmm. So these are positive. Um, the child's behavior or social skills have changed since the IEP mm -hmm. was created. You might need a meeting, you know, it, right. or you might need an amendment. Uh, you get a call from your teacher to say that the child has been showing some new behaviors or some negative attitudes. Um, then you again, you listen, you acknowledge, you get a meeting. So mm -hmm. different things, IEP services aren't provided as you expected them right. to, here's what you do. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't come to an agreement with the district, here's what here's you do. Here's what you do. So this is, if you find this situation, here's here's your next right. step. It's, right. So this can be helpful, and as I said, that they're, they are attached as handouts here for creating a good IEP and for the implementation mm -hmm. of the IEP. I, and I have one more question, okay. and, and as educators, both of us know, Know that that sometimes things don't go well during during the year, and parents and educators and their IEP team can can go through a really difficult year that's that's inflamed a lot of difficult feelings mm -hmm. uh, in in trying to address some of the issues that are occurring with a, with a particular student. And if you finished one of those years. What what would you what's your your advice for how you support your student your child for a good school year a better school year next year and of course they know kids know what you know the things that are going on right but right. what can you do to set yourself on a track to have a good school year when you've had an experience like that from the parents point of view um, I think again a lot of footwork in the summer uh -huh. and it would even in the spring to find out. Who is your teacher going to be for the next year if it's the same building? Mm -hmm. Who is this teacher going to be? Um, would you please, principal, select a teacher who you think would work best with my student? Mm -hmm. uh, please don't give him this overly enthusiastic, loud teacher that might, you know, so look to pave the path to put him in a place that's successful. Mm -hmm. And then um, even looking at what, why. It occurred like once it was a right. bad school year. Why did that occur? Was it because uh, the family divorced during that year? Was it because his current teacher didn't quite understand him? Mm -hmm. So look at why it occurred and see how to remedy that mm -hmm. and pull the team together. And then beginning of the year with the team, the new team, um, right. show them that you're a cooperator, mm -hmm. that you want the best and you're there to support them. I think right. once they know that, then you can get the footwork in the right step. Right, right. That, and I think, and, and bring in the communication form. Yes. Because the yes. communication throughout, particularly if you've had a difficult year, the communicate setting up a good communication system for the next year is going to help avoid some of and that. And you know, one of the funny things that I've seen both as a parent and a teacher, and see parents surprised at this, they'll, for any child, not just uh -huh. our children with special needs, they'll say, well, he did so good last year. I don't know what happened to this year and that tells you what a difference you know in the same building yes. the teacher could make the you know just a combination of teacher thought child right. teacher but yeah that's that that can happen mm -hmm. and you don't want your child to carry on that reputation right. that you know he's this he's an x type of child and he always will be right and you just right. want to let the new team know because he was that way last year he was that way in that situation now this year we right. know more and it's a different situation and, right and we are creating a different situation. Right. That, that, I think that's our purpose. Right. Margaret, thank you very much for sharing your ideas and sharing your materials with us. You're I really welcome. appreciate it. Well, thank, thank you, you for asking. Thank Thanks. you.